your name, God. <clears throat> Praise you, Jesus. God, we worship you. We magnify your great name, O oh God. Truly, you're holy. You are sovereign. You're majestic. You're everything we need, O oh God. When we call on your name, God, you answer us. According to your will, you are the light in the midst of darkness. You illuminate our pathway, O oh God, that we can worship you, God, in spirit and in truth. The blood of Jesus cleansed us from all sins and we're benefactors of your redemption. We exalt your name, O oh God, above the heavens and the earth, oh God. For you rule, you reign, you have dominion and authority. There's none like you, Lord. You are our hiding place, oh God. You always fill our heart with songs of deliverance. And we thank you, Lord, hallelujah. Whenever we are afraid, God, we can trust in you the author and finisher of our faith. What a glorious God you are. You are holy, O oh God. There's none like you in all the earth. Have your way in us, O oh God, on today. Saturate in your anointing, empowered by your grace, O oh God. Keep us steadfast in the faith of Jesus Christ. For truly, God, there's none like you in all the earth. You are faithful, God, to your word and to your promises. We honor you, King Jesus, for who you are. And we thank you, Lord God, that you keep us steadfast, unmovable, always abounded in the work of the Lord, that our labor would not be in vain. We exalt your name, O oh God. We praise you for who you are. You are faithful, Lord God. You're faithful, you're faithful, you're faithful, God. Faithful to keep us from falling, present us faultless for the brightness of your glory. With exceeding joy, God, we honor you tonight. We exalt you, God. We praise you. You are Jehovah Rafika, the Lord God, our healer, God. We thank you, Lord God. You are our deliverer. You are our sanctifier. You are the bread of heaven that feeds us to we want no more, oh God. You are the living word, Lord God. We honor your presence, God, tonight. We thank you for being good and merciful towards us, your people, God. Hallelujah, God, I worship you. I worship you, Lord God. I worship you in spirit and truth. I worship you, God, in the midst of adversities, in the midst of trials, in the midst of tests, in the midst of our loved ones being attacked with infirmities, God. I worship you, King Jesus. You are glorified. You're high and lifted up, oh God. Your kingdom reigns and have dominion and authority, God. There's none like you. I worship you, Lord God. I lift you up, King Jesus, for you are worthy Lamb of God. You're high and lifted up, oh God. You're concerned about your people, God. And we bless your name tonight, oh God. We thank you, hallelujah, for hearing us when we call in your name, oh God. Delivering us, oh God. Bringing us through many different obstacles in our lives, oh God. Things we couldn't fix on our own. You made a way, God. And we thank you, hallelujah, Jesus. God bless the shine. Thank you, Lord God. You are the rock of our salvation, our God in whom we can trust and depend on. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I come here for your awesome presence and thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity, oh God, to teach your word once again. I thank you, Lord God, for being the Lord and Savior of our lives from eternity to eternity. Thou art God. We lift up this evening, Father God, my mother, oh God, as she's going through uh, a challenge in her health in the hospital this evening, God, Deacon Cannon, as he's being faced, Father, with issues in his body tonight, oh God, even our brother Willie Davis, oh God, we just lift them up, Deacon Davis, God, we lift them up, oh God, that your, your presence would touch their bodies, heal and deliver my cousin Tim in this marriage situation, God, that you would bring restoration, healing, God, in broken relationships, God, and many others who are dealing with marital problems on tonight, oh God. We come as intercessors, God, standing in the gap that the anointing would flow in their direction, that the power of God would touch their lives in a supernatural way to be changes in their minds and in their lives, oh God, to restore the relationship 
relationship, restore the marriage. We bring revival, God, restoration, restoration, restoration. We thank you, oh God, for all the redeemed Faith Church family and Safe Haven, Pastor Terry, and our family, God. We just pray right now, God, for healing in her body, God, and her, her husband, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, both being afflicted in their health, oh God. Father, there's so many people are dealing with this COVID virus, dealing with the flu, pneumonia, all these different illnesses are plaguing their bodies tonight, oh God. But we come believing in the blood of Jesus, God. We plead the blood, that the blood still works, oh God. That the devil is a liar, that Jesus Christ is Lord. He reigns, he conquered, he redeemed, he delivered, he set free his people from all manner of sicknesses and diseases, God. And we thank you, Lord God, for the power of the word of God. That your word shall prevail, oh God, against all this mess, oh God, in the, in the airways, oh God that's touching people's body, cause them to be afflicted, God, that you release the balm of Gilead, God, the anointing salve of the Holy Spirit, that your people begin to stand on the word of God and put some action with their word to benefit, to make their health better, God. That they begin to gravitate, oh God, to uh, vitamins and minerals and substances, God, that will help promote health in their bodies in the mighty name of Jesus. We rebuke the devourer, God. We come against the spirit of death tonight, oh God, that your people will not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. Even Pastor Anderson and his family, God, dealing with the grandmother in the hospital, God. We just believe, oh God, that you're faithful even to heal, Father, a 99-year-old woman, God. You can do it, God. There's nothing too hard for our God. You said with man, things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And we come believing in faith, oh God, that you said you are rewarded those who diligently seek you, for without faith, we cannot even please you, God. We ask today oh God, that you stretch our faith beyond the limitations, oh God. Stretch our faith even in Pilgrim Church tonight, oh God, where my dad is, Father. Cover his body, his mind, the spirit. Heal, God, in Jesus' name. Father, the Emory family in a whole, Father God, many are afflicted, God. Some with mental torment, some, Father, with diseases, God. But we decree and declare healing, oh God, tonight. Healing around them, within them, that will begin to flow from heart to heart, that the power of God will touch them, oh God, in a supernatural way, oh God. The cold family, oh God. Oh, the cold, oh God. We lift them up, God. We thank you, oh God, for healing in his mind, oh God. What dementia tried to take hold, God. We speak healing in his mind, oh God. And his family be supportive to him, God, that you draw them out, Father God. Father God, begin to love on him in the name of Jesus. Father, we need you to bring us back to the place of compassion. Bring us back to a place of sensitiveness, to be caring and concerned about one another, God. That we begin to pray for one another without ceasing. You said in your word, it's the will of God. And we ask tonight, oh God, that you break us, shake us, make us, mold us to your image and your likeness. That you would be glorified in all of our lives. Forgive us, God, for our sins and lawless deeds. Forgive us for our rebellious ways. Forgive us for being stubborn, making excuses. The reason why we can't fellowship with one another. Forgive us, God, and bring us back to the place of oneness. Your word says, behold how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And we thank you, O God, that the unity, it can be in this season restored as we trust in you in your word, God, because you spoke and it was done. You commanded and it stood fast. And we thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that you are the Lord of glory, the Prince of Peace, even Pastor Shaw family tonight, oh God, touch his family, God, in a supernatural way. Heal, oh God, their broken hearts from the time of loss, oh God, in their family. Even Pastor Lewis tonight, God, who lost their, his father, God. We ask tonight, God, that many people who lost their love with God, that you comfort their broken hearts and bind their wounds, that you manifest your mercy and your grace, your love, your strength, and your power in all those families whose hearts are broken and torn to now, God, that it will sense your presence embracing them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Those of you who just came on, good evening. Praise the Lord, Pastor Neeson. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. 
We bless the name of the Lord tonight for your good. It's mercy and do it forever. Been getting just news, bad news after bad news after bad news. But I tell you, when bad news come, put a praise on it. Just put a praise on it. Because I, I tell you, if you allow the bad news that people bring you to affect you, it'll make you miserable. But when you have a relationship with the Lord, you have a connection with the Father who intercedes through His Son in our behalf to bring us good news. And that good news is that God still heals, God still delivers, God still saves, God still redeems, God still is a refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. He's still faithful to his word that every time we call on his name, he will answer us according to his will. That's how good our God is. So I encourage you tonight, let the Lord be your guide on tonight, be your strength that his presence will endow you to perfect you, to empower you, to keep moving in the light of truth as he is glorified in all of our lives. Amen. I want to start off tonight. I found a new book this week. I ordered it last week. It's um, Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. Jesus Calling. One of my friends, my little spiritual son that works in the building, um, shared this book on Facebook several times in the last few months. And as I looked at some of the pages he was sharing on there, I said, I got to get this book myself. It's really a good book. It's Jesus Calling. Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. Jesus Calling. And it's a daily devotional for a whole year. Daily devotional for the whole year. And on day 17, which today is the 17th, it says, Come to me with a thankful heart so you can enjoy my presence. This is the day that I have made. I want you to rejoice today. Refusing to worry about tomorrow, search for all that I have prepared for you, anticipating abundant blessings and accepting difficulties as they come. Accepting difficulties as they come. I can weave miracles into the most mundane day if you keep your focus on me. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing how, how God instructed her to write this word to encourage us? It says, come to me with all your needs, knowing that my glorious riches are more than adequate supply. My glorious riches are more than adequate supply. Stay in continual communication with me so that you can live above your circumstances even while you are in the midst of them. My presence or present is to present your request to me with thanksgiving and my peace which surpasses all comprehensions will guard your heart and mind. Philippians chapter 4, nine, verse 19, verse 6 and 7, and Psalms 118, verse 24. Psalms 118, verse 24. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, and chapter 6 and 7, it's in reference to as well. Really great, great word. Great word. I like that. That's a really good word. So in our book tonight, we're going back to our book tonight, The Bait of Satan, we're back in our book. We're going to be on page in the book. If you're following along in the book, we're on page 88. Page 88 in the book. Okay? Page 88 in the book. Last week we talked about depending on God's character and how a lot of times we allow the enemy to afflict us, to make us doubt God's ability, to doubt God's word. And one thing about the enemy, he knows how to manipulate God's word to make it sound like God doesn't care about you, he doesn't love you, he doesn't want you, and all those things. But I want to encourage you that God loves you. God cares about you. God is for you. He's greater than the world and they who can be against you. 
when we are rooted and grounded, when we bear the intense love and, and trust in God, no storm, no matter how intense, can ever move us. No storm, no matter how intense they are, cannot move you out of your character, out of your position, because we're grounded in the foundation of the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the gift of grace to all who place their confidence in God. Throwing away the confidence of self, which depended on yourself. Because you found out you can't depend on yourself because yourself will fail you. But God never abandoned us. God never turns his backs on us. He never changes his mind about us. But he loves us unconditionally. Even when we make a mistake, he still loves us. Isn't that wonderful to know that the creator, God who created everything, he still loves us unconditionally. And yet he would never turn his back on you. So tonight we want to continue in our book. Chapter 8, it says grace is given to the humble. Grace is given to the humble. Simon Peter could no longer boast of being great. He had lost his natural confidence. He saw all too clearly the futility of his own strong will. And he had been humbled. He is now perfect candidate for the grace of God. Isn't that wonderful? When you think about it, how we once trusted in our own strength, our own ability to lead ourselves, guide ourselves, fix our own situations, and just kept making a mess, a mess, a mess, a mess. And when God allowed you to get into a place where it humbled you, then you realize that I became a perfect candidate for the grace of God. That's lovely. That's awesome. Because the word tells it for you to say, through faith and, uh, and by grace, through faith and knowledge of yourself is the gift of God. So we're saved through faith by the grace of God that I'm a candidate for God's mercy, his compassion, his love, his gentleness, his meekness, his forbearance. I'm a candidate for the presence of God to dwell with me all the time. Humility is a prerequisite. Humility is a prerequisite. It was a lesson burned in the conscience of Peter as he wrote in his epistle. And uh, let me go to the scripture here. Give me one second because I want to read this in the Bible here. And second and first Peter, first Peter chapter five, first Peter chapter five. I want to read this in that chapter. Glory to God. Glory to God. My, my, my. So 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elders. Yea, all of you be subject to one another, and be clothed with what? Humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So what God does, it says here, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. When we humble ourselves, let go our selfish ambitions, our pride, proud hearts, God will begin to lead you in the promises, the blessings, and the favor he has for your life. Many times, many believers miss what God is trying to perfect in their lives because they get stuck in the mindset of carnality. Carnality is the mindset that Paul talked about to the church of Galatia. He told them that the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God, an enemy of God. Why? Because the mind of the flesh, it contradicts the word of God. The mind of the flesh, it opposes the word of God. 
the mind of the flesh would not submit to the word of God. So in, in return, God says judgment falls on them because of rebellion. But if I be clothed in humility, I wear it as a cloak, a garment. Anytime I'm clothed in humility, I'm clothed in Jesus Christ. He spoke to the church in, in Ephesus. He told them to put off the old man and his nature and put on a new man, which is clothed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you put on Jesus Christ, you put it on humility. So I'm not quick to become offensive. I'm not quick to get out of character. I'm not quick to get upset when people say things to me I don't like, when they do things to me that they shouldn't have done, when they step on my toes, they mistreat me, they abuse me, I still walk in humility. I found out from my own self that every time people get upset with you is because if you're walking in truth and righteousness, you're aggravating their, you're aggravating their demons. You're aggravating their demons. That's a true statement. Because the demons in that individual can't stand where you act. Because you act like Jesus. And the devil knows those who act like Jesus. He knows those who are real in their identity that fashion their image and nature after Christ. So what he does, he attacks the ones who are living for the Lord to see how far I can push you. But he doesn't realize the things that he does to you, it promotes you. Isn't that wonderful? Promotion in persecution. I'm going to preach that one day. Promotion in persecution. Because when persecution comes, instead of you getting out of character, getting all upset, and getting all disfigured in your face, getting mad, put a praise on it. Because when you praise God in your storm, you're giving God the ability to take the vengeance in his own hand towards your adversary. He told us in his word, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the rules of the darkness of this age and spiritual wickedness in high places. So we got to understand there's a hierarchy realm in the spirit world of demonic forces. You got the principalities and the powers and the rulers of this age that we fight against every day where? In the spirit. When you get in the spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of you reveals to you exactly what the enemy is trying to do to pull you off track. If we're not prayed up, we're not seeking the face of God. And we're supposed to walk in his presence every day by grace. You're saved through faith and all yourself to get to God. So the grace of God keeps me. The grace of God empowers me. The grace of God strengthens me. The grace of God carries me. And if I get out of line with the grace of God, then I'm walking back in carnality. And carnality would keep you in a dark place absent of the light. In Isaiah chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. If you're writing notes, write these scriptures down and revisit them when you get a chance because they're going to help you. He says in the King James Version, I'm going to read it in the King James and Amplify it. The King James says, Arise, and that's a comma, Pause and think about this. What do you need to do? Shine. Do what? Shine. For thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. So even though I go through persecution, even though I get ostracized, Get slandered, scandered, all that stuff. Talk, they talk about me. They put me down. The word says, with the capital letters, arise and shine in capital letters. That means you need to be captivated in the presence of God. And it says in the Amplified, it says, arise, 
from depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to the new life. Shine. Be radiant with the glory of the Lord. For, the Lord, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Radiant. Anything that's radiant is visible. It's real bright. Like the sun is radiant. I can't look in the sun without burning my eyes. So the glory of God is radiant upon your life. He says, when you get in position, and guess, check this out. He says, arise from depression. Arise from prostration. So that means I'm down here in a miserable place. I'm crying out to God. God, help me. Deliver me. Bring me out, God. And God says, arise. And what he's saying is the Messiah. He was given a word. Isaiah was given a word of hope to the children of Israel who was in captivity. He was letting him know that the Messiah, when he comes, the glory is going to be revealed. But in the time span where you are, you need to get in position to allow the glory to come where you are. Well, every time God led the children of Israel any place in the wilderness, the glory went before them. And when God came down and he visited with Moses on the mountaintop, the glory was with him. When God came into the tabernacles, the glory filled the temple. Why? Because God had to show them the radiant of my glory will surround you and engulf you to where you have no choice but to allow the light to shine through you. That's why they had to put a veil on Moses' face because his face shined like the noonday sun. They couldn't even look into Moses' face when he came from the mountain top. Because Moses spent time in the presence of God, which is something else for us today. When you spend time in the presence of God, people should be able to see the glory of God on you. They should be able to see God's light shining through you. Because we are the vessels, the tabernacles of the modern day time where the presence of God dwells. So when God comes down in your house, right where you are, the glory comes. The glory fills the house. The glory fills your life. The glory changes your mind. It changes your lifestyle. It changes the words that come out of your mouth. It changes everything about you. Peter had been shaken to the verge of giving up. We know this by the message the angel of the Lord gave to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. But go tell his disciples and Peter. Isn't that something? Peter got broke down because he denied Jesus Christ. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he had to reassure Peter that my love is still there for you. Even though we deny Jesus today, God still reveals his glory to us and reassures us like he told Mary Magdalene, go tell Peter that I've risen. He says that he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. And he said to, said to you, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 7. So in Mark chapter 16, verse 7, so go your way, tell the disciples and Peter that he go up before you into Galilee, and there you shall see him as he said unto you. 1 Peter, I mean, Mark chapter 16, verse 7. Mark 16, verse 7. It's so amazing how Peter, the one that said, Lord, I die for you. Lord, I go with you to the end of the earth. Denied Jesus. Got to a place of depression, a place of misery. When he hid himself after Christ was crucified, and then Christ comes along to reassure him after the resurrection that, hey, I still love you. You're still my, my disciple. I still care for you. And you're going to see me just like I promised. <coughs> Excuse me. The angel had to single him out. 
Peter was, was at the point of a shipwreck, but God still laid the foundation in him. It would not be removed by the shaking, but strengthened. Even though he was at the point of shipwreck, Jesus reassured him that my foundation of love is still in your heart. Jesus not only forgave Peter, but he also restored him. Now that he had been shaken, he was ready to become the central figure of the church. He was courageously proclaimed the resurrection of Christ before the very one responsible for his crucifixion. Isn't it amazing? The very one that denied Jesus, the very one God restored, and now he's very bold and tenacious and courageous to go and tell the ones who crucified him what they did. He faced the council, not the servant girl, with great authority and boldness. He stood up to them. History, his, history excuse me, <coughs> history reports that Peter was crucified upside down after many years of faithful service. Peter loved the Lord so much, he didn't want to be killed the way Jesus died. He said, you're going to crucify me? Crucify me upside down. Because I, I, I'm not worthy to die the way my Savior died. I want to die the way I feel the Lord leading me to die. That people would know that I live my life for the Lord. He insisted he was unworthy to die the same death his Lord had died. So they hung him upside down. He was no longer afraid. He was, stone, he was a stone built on a solid foundation of the rock. Peter became a stone, a pillar for many believers to come to Christ. Trials in his life, even in your life, will expose what is in your heart, whether defense towards God or others. Tests either will make you bitter towards God and your peers or stronger. Isn't that something? Tests will either make you bitter or make you stronger. So it's your choice. Are you willing to die for Jesus? Are you willing to give your life everything you have for Jesus? I, 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 I was speak, talking to someone earlier and I shared this word. It costs to carry the anointing. It costs to carry the anointing. Matter of fact, it was LaShonda, I was talking to her earlier. The anointing on your life is so valuable. And a lot of people don't take it pricely. They don't, they don't really understand it. So they don't value it. What I don't know, I'm not going to study, try to find out. So I just accept it. I got anointing, but I don't know how to use anointing. I don't know how to operate an anointing. So I don't value the anointing. So anything that comes against me, I do not use the anointing. When you get a revelation of the anointing that's upon your life, the power of God strengthens you. It encourages you. It motivates you. He stirs you up through the Holy Spirit to become bold as a lion, to proclaim the gospel truth to anyone you come in contact with. And the anoint to begin to operate just like Jesus. I love the chosen, the, the series they just brought out recently. How Jesus... He can touch somebody and power come out of him. How Jesus could speak a word, power come out of him. And the same power he said, I give to you. He said, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. If you don't know how to operate anointing, get in your word. Because the word would tell you what Jesus done and demonstrate how to operate in the anointing in your life. And the same anointing, it causes demons to flee at the name of Jesus. It caused cancer to dry up at the name of Jesus. Caused tumors and masses to be eradicated 
in the name of Jesus through the power of the anointing. And every time we're tested, either we're going to get bitter in the midst of the test, or like I mentioned earlier, put a praise on it. Because I found out my praise is a weapon. Every time the enemy attacked me, I, I get in my house and I start playing my worship songs, playing some praise music, something to ignite the fire, to stand against bitterness and depression, anxiety and stress and worrying and sickness and disease. Even when I was sick for those two weeks, almost three weeks I was sick from taking the flu shot. And the more the enemy tried to flick me, the more I praised God. And the more I did what God instructed me to do, take some, drink some herbal teas, take some supplements, eat healthy foods, stuff that will help benefit health in my body. Being led by the Holy Ghost through the anointing. The anointing operates in your life through your obedience to the word of God. Did you catch that? The anointing operates in your life through your obedience in the word of God. If you do not obey the word of God, how can you expect to operate in the anointing? Think about it. If you know that God has given you a gift of the anointing and you don't be obedient to God's word, the anointing is not going to work for you. It's not going to work. You can take all the oil in the world, anoint your head with oil. You can pour a whole bottle of oil over yourself. They ain't going to do nothing. You're just going to be an oily, oily person in the kingdom. And the word of God becomes ineffective. Ineffective in your life. Because you refuse to allow the Holy Spirit to drive you to the place of submission. To his lordship and his authority. If you pass the test, check this out. If you pass the test, your roots will shoot down deeper. If you pass the test, your roots will shoot down deeper, stabilizing you and your future. That's a good word for somebody tonight. If you pass the test, your roots will stabilize you. It will, it will get you to a place of a solid foundation where God can mature you in his word by the Holy Spirit. It is so amazing how when we listen and obey, we sprout roots and we grow and we mature in the things of God. If you fail, you become offended which can lead to defilement with bitterness. If you fail to pass a test, check this out. I was thinking about this recently. Why so many people find themselves in the same old relationships, the same predicaments, the same problem, the same issue when they're child of God? And God said, Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah 59. I was studying these scriptures on yesterday. I shared it with, with, with uh, LaShonda and one of my cousins, Jabbar, in Chicago. I shared this word with them. I was reading chapter 55 all the way to 61. And I was studying these scriptures. And God showed me something. Isaiah chapter 59, starting at verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. Then it goes on, said, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. That's the reason so many so-called born-again believers, children of God, are in the same predicaments over and over, going through the same old cycle in life, the same old problems, 
every year round the same season, the same thing happens. Because you refuse to learn from the lesson the first time. When God begins to teach you something in the midst of persecution and tribulation and tests in your life, you need to learn from it and progress forward past it. But instead, we get stuck in the midst of the problems and the situation, refuse to trust God and his word to lead God and direct me to where truth and righteousness. So my iniquity, my rebellious, stubborn heart, it separates me from God where God can't hear me. God only hears. Check this out. God only hears a true repentant heart, a penitent heart, a heart that's sorry for sin. If your heart is penitent, I'm deeply sorry for sin. God says it's godly sorrow that draws me into repentance. So if I have a godly sorrow in my heart going through the same old cycle, I said this last week. We nurse, curse, and rehearse our problems. We nurse, curse, and rehearse our problems. So everything I go through, I keep rehearsing it. I keep nursing it. I'm babying my, my situation. I'm looking for a pity party. I want somebody to agree with me. I'm miserable, so come join me in my misery. So because I'm hurt, I want you to come sympathize with me because I'm hurt. So I nurse my problems. I curse the problem. Then it never goes away, and I rehearse it. Rehearse, nurse, and curse. So I keep on doing the same thing. I rehearse it. I nurse it, and I curse it. So I keep the thing alive. When God comes to kill and destroy the things that come to destroy you in your life, to give your life more bonded, I keep nursing, cursing, rehearsing my problem. So when God's trying to deliver me, the way of peace, I do not know. The way of peace, I do not know. Why? Because of transgressions. Let's go a little further. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perverseness. All because you refuse to humble before God. So you allow your sin to become your Lord and your master, your idol. We, I, I preached on Sunday about moving forward, how a lot of things in our lives become idols. And we wonder why God is not hearing us when we call upon him. Because I have made other things God, God in my life. And idols are your God. So when God began to speak, he says, none calleth for justice, nor pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and they speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. So it's a cycle. It's a cycle. I don't call for justice. I'm not ready to return. I'm not ready to do right. So there's no justice. There's no plea for truth. I'm not ready to follow truth. I'm going to keep being rebellious. I trust in my vanity, my falsehood. I speak lies. And then I conceive, I plot and plan evil devices towards other people in my heart. And then he says, and I bring forth iniquity. So I begin to plot and plan evil, malice, hatred, jealousy, covetousness in my heart towards other people. So I begin to manifest those things. Because I thought about it, I premeditated it in my mind, and now I make it happen. Then he goes on. He says, they hatch cockatrice eggs, which is a snake. They weave spider webs. He that eateth their eggs dieth. And that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. So they hatch Eggs, snake eggs, they weave spider webs to entangle other people. Matter of fact, they trap themselves. Don't realize you're trapping yourself. Everything you plant to other people is happening to you. And he says, and you eat the eggs and you die. So you eat a snake egg, you're going to die. And he says, and then the eggs that are crushed, the ones you didn't eat, they produce vipers. So now I got vipers that manifest in my heart. So my tongue become a poisonous venom towards other people. My tongue is toxic. Read James chapter chapter what? Chapter five. Talk about the tongue. The tongue becomes a venomous poison towards other people. So I begin to gossip, backbite, hate on folk, talk about them, slander them, put them down, curse them, 
all this stuff because I gave in to the spirit of the enemy of rebellion. My God, my God, my God. We got to do better, people. We got to do better. We got to change. We got to stop making excuses for our sin. Stop making excuses for our bad habits. Stop making excuses for not going to church. Stop making excuses. Because when God compels you, he comes to you and say, what are you doing, my son? Why were you in church when you need to be there? You went to the store, you went shopping, but you wouldn't come to church. But you can go to the basketball games, baseball games, football games. You can go everywhere you want to go, but when it comes to coming to church, I got an excuse. God says, stop making excuses. Because your excuses, it negates the word of God. Your excuses make the word of God not effective. I don't care how much you call yourself a pastor, a bishop, a prophet, a teacher, an evangelist, a missionary worker. If you don't fellowship with other believers, you're out of order with God. Because he, he puts solitary in the church where the church will come together in one accord to glean from each other, to build each other up. Because he said he placed gifts in the church for the upbuilding of the saints. Your gifts and other people's gifts come together, builds the body. He doesn't have long rangers in his kingdom. He calls us all out of our secret closets to come back to the place of fellowship where we can build each other up in one accord in the body of Christ. Then he goes on to their webs shall not become garments. Neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are the works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. That's one of the reasons. I, I, I read this over and over and over, and I said, that explains why so many so-called Christians are quick to get angry because their works are full of iniquity. Your heart is not humble. You're not submitted, don't have a repentable heart. So anyone offends you, you're mad real quick and want to retaliate and take vengeance in your hand. This is the reason why. Because the works are the works of iniquity. And iniquity is a word for wickedness. So you got wickedness in your works. But yet I say I'm serving God. I say I'm praising God. I say I'm worshiping God, but I haven't allowed God to get in me. So I'm a lip server. Jesus says it like this. This people, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Let's go a little further. One more scripture. I'm going to start right here this one. It says their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. And their thoughts are the thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their path. Wasting and destruction are in their path. Why? Because their thoughts are filled with iniquity. Their thoughts are filled with wickedness. And you wonder why it seems like God doesn't hear you. And when you're praying, like your prayers hit the ceiling and bounce back because you're out of order with God. And God is calling us tonight, get it right, get back in order. Because if you fail, you become offended, which leads to defilement and bitterness. So I encourage you tonight, read Isaiah chapter 59, the whole chapter, all the way through 61. Isaiah 59, all through chapter 61. And I guarantee, if you listen in the spirit, God is going to speak to you a rhema word. It's going to be something you need to hear to help change your attitude, to change your lifestyle, to change your excuses, and cause you to be convicted in your heart to start being obedient to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He told us not to quench the Holy Spirit. We quench the Spirit of God, which grieve or sadden him by our rebellious ways. Every time the Holy Spirit is trying to lead us in the pathway of righteousness, 
to study God's word, to meditate on the word, keep the word in your mouth, keep it in your heart, don't let it depart from you, that the word will make you successful and cause you to prosper. And when you go, we deny the word of God. We rebel against the word of God. We, we resist the Holy Spirit leadership and we follow as Isaiah chapter 58. Matter of fact, read 58 too. It talks about fasting. Isaiah chapter 58. In chapter 58, he says, he said, you you fast for your own pleasure. You don't fast the way I want you to fast to satisfy me, to bring me glory. And that's where we have to really pay attention. The enemy comes in a subtle way to de deceive you, to manipulate you, to distract you, and deter you from your purpose. And God has given us an assignment. And that assignment is to go and make disciples of men baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He said, and lo, I will be with you always, even in the end of the world. How can I share the gospel with somebody else if I'm not going to follow it myself? I'm a hypocrite. I'm a liar. I'm a deceiver. Like I, I was watching this one, this one movie, again, I watched it again yesterday, The Remaining. It's about the rapture when it came. And this pastor who was over at church, he recognized he was only doing it for fame and glory. Didn't have God in his heart. Wasn't really serving God at all. Didn't want to serve God. Just doing it for the money. He said, I was a charlatan. And he says, but when the rapture came, he was left behind. It was an eye opening for him to make him think about the life he lived. He really didn't live for Jesus. And the moment he came to conviction, there was a beast, like Revelation chapter 9, talking about the beast being released in the earth. And he said they have the image, of, of, of the image, the face of a, a human, human man, the hair of a woman, teeth like a lion, a scorpion's tail, and they have claws like, like an eagle. So he says this beast is going to be released upon the earth to afflict the people with sickness, to punish them, to torture them to make them get to a place of repentance. And so this preacher, when he finally made up his mind, you know what? I, I deceive you. He told the people that were in there in the church coming for refuge from the, from the rapture and the hell storm and all this stuff that's happening, dark gloom and all this stuff that's taking place, place. Like he said, the revelation, he repented. And when he repented, he said, I'm going to start being a pastor now from this day forward. Then the enemy came with the beast and it took him. It took his body, but his soul went to heaven. I encourage you tonight, don't allow the enemy to continue to deceive and distract you from your purpose, from walking in your calling, because there are so many different excuses we're quick to make up when I just don't want to follow God. I was one of those doing the same thing quick to make an excuse. And I found out my obedience caused the anointing to wax strong upon my life. I couldn't teach, I couldn't preach the way I do if I had not learned how to surrender to Jesus Christ and his lordship and his authority in my life. And I encourage you tonight, get on your knees before God. Repent before God. If you know you're one of them who've been a lip server, false in your belief system, not living right for the Lord, repent. Get it right with God. And I guarantee he will welcome you into the kingdom. He'll restore you. He'll revive you. He'll clean you up. He'll fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness for him. That's what God will do for you. We're going to end right here on this point. Next week, we're going to talk about, Lord, I have served you. So why? Lord, I have served you. So why? We're going to talk about that next week. We're going to go deep into this, this, this book even more. I, I love teaching this book because it's changing my life in the process. And I guarantee that the revelation from this book is going to give you a rhema word. It's going to change your mind and change your life for the better. So Lord God, tonight I thank you for those who participated in this lesson tonight. I pray, oh God, that you speak to their hearts all of our hearts bring conviction, bring change, that we want to be better. We want to try to do better, try to live better, 
do what you call us to do, God, without excuses, without compromising. That we humble ourselves before your lordship and your authority under the mighty hand of God. That you will lift us up in due season and promote your glory in our lives. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want, to, want you to repeat after me tonight. If you don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, um, the words that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. You can receive this relationship with Jesus Christ tonight just by one simple prayer. You might even be a backslider who once walked with the Lord and something happened in your life that caused you to make a, a U-turn and walk away from Jesus. I want to let you know you never walked away from him. He's still there. He still loves you. He still care about you. His arms are still open wide just for you to bring you back into fellowship with himself. All you got to do is pray this simple prayer. For the word says that if thou shalt confess thy mouth to the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Jesus died. He was buried and rose again for our salvation. So I want you to repeat after me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me for my sins and my iniquity. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me by grace and favor of the living God, through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You prayed that prayer. You just got born again and just restored in the presence of the Lord. So I'm looking forward. I got an announcement too. I'm looking forward um, us to continue to pray. We have a prayer tomorrow night at 6 o'clock at our church. We invite you to come out and join us. We're going to pray because a lot of our, our church members have been out ill in these last few weeks. And uh, Deacon Cannon is out ill. He's in the hospital. Not only him, but Brother Davis is afflicted with cancer. And we want to continue to pray for our brothers and sisters that God will heal and deliver. And many others with this pneumonia and the flu, they're, they're afflicted with these illnesses. And I believe in the power of prayer that where there's two or three gathered in the name of the Lord, his presence will show up in the midst. And he will heal your people. He says, my people who call by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from him, forgive the sin, and heal the land. Then he says, there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. If he commit any sin, then sin will be forgiven, that he may be healed. That's a promise we have in God's word. Healing comes through forgiveness. If you hold in unforgiveness, it keeps you sick. You got to let go of the unforgiveness that the healing power can flow through you. And then another thing I'm working on is... um doing a live virtual class, a live virtual class where we all can participate in the class and talk with each other back and forth. There's a program that another church I know of called Risen, Risen Springs in Chicago. I preached with them several times and um, on their live stream on Sunday morning. And it's called Blue Jean, Blue Dream Virtual, Blue Jean Virtual Streaming, Blue Jean Virtual Streaming. And it's a very beautiful platform well, all you have to do is log in with a code into this software. You have to download it on your computer or download it on your phone. And you'll be able to log into this program and you'll be able to participate live stream in the class. So I'm working on doing that as well to continue to keep streaming from Facebook too. I'm, I'm going to figure that out on how we're going to do that. I've been talking to the pastor of our church about it. He's, he's uh, uh, interested in doing this as well. So we're going to run it by the church on this coming Sunday to see um, how many people would be interested in participating in this live stream class where we can all glean from each other and have input with each other in our classes in the near future. So keep praying for us. We're looking to bring the vision of the church into fruition to make it better. Even in our live stream, if people are not coming out to the church for Bible class, then I figure we can do a virtual class. And to do the virtual class will be just as effective as being in the church as well, because we'll be able to talk to each other and hear each other's voice and see each other as well. So you all stay encouraged. If you want to sow a donation into the class tonight, feel free to do that. The link is on the bottom of the page. So a donation into the class. Every donation goes back into the church going towards our project. We have a project. We're working on it. It's remodeling the whole church sometime this year, breaking ground. 
And so we want to continue to lift up Redeemed Faith Fellowship Church at 3223 West Lloyd Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where we're going to be meeting tomorrow night for prayer. 3223 West Lloyd Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I want you to join us for prayer and keep us in your prayers. And trust God to continue to manifest his vision and his dreams and his plans in your life to be fulfilled as well. And I know God would do it. If you do it for us, he's going to do it for you too. So every seed you sow into the ministry goes back into the ministry. So I encourage you to sow a seed. Doesn't matter the amount. It can be five dollars, be a dollar. Sow a seed. Do it in faith. Believe that when you sow your seed, God said you give, give up. What it said, you give grudgingly or of necessity. That's not true giving. But you see, he loves a cheerful giver, a humble giver. So you give, give uh, bountifully, you you reap bountifully. But if you give a little, you reap a little. So we got to be faithful, even when God say give, to obey God's word, to do what he says to do. Amen. So you all have a blessed night. So Lord God, now may, may the grace of God, sweet communion of the Spirit rest upon us until we meet again. Now, now, now Lord God, I pray to you lift your countenance. Cause your face to be turned towards your people. Father, show them favor. That you turn towards them, O oh God, and bless them in everything they do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Any questions, anybody? <clears throat> Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Before we go, any questions? All right. Well, no questions. Thank you all for your participation again and the hearts that are going up. Thank you for uh, validating the word tonight that is blessing you. I thank God for you all as well. Couldn't, can't do it without you. Now, and continue to invite others to join us each week as well. Invite others to join us. Because if it's blessing you, somebody else needs to hear the same word to change their life as well. All right, until next week, Tuesday, 6 o'clock, you have a blessed night. If you join us tomorrow at 6 o'clock p.m. for prayer, we'll see you there. Until then, next week, God bless you. Have a good night.